here at the American Foreign Policy Council. I'd like to welcome you today to this event. Um, uh, we did like airplanes and we overbooked, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, as the ambassador said, or as the deputy Georgia can always uh, ensure a full house. Uh, but in any case, we're very happy to have you here. We're still waiting for our, our third speaker, who, who did t tell us from the beginning, uh, Mr. Carpenter, that he's going to be a little bit late. So I think Mamuka will show him the way in when he when he comes. Um, but the um, the uh, reason we're here today is to, to discuss not only Georgia, but also how the United States can help Georgia in uh, a time that many people here in Washington and elsewhere think is uh, an increasingly difficult political time. Um, and of course, in this room, there are many people I recognize who are not just friends of Georgia, but who have uh, been involved for 20 years or more in both helping Georgia defend its sovereignty, but also support its political development. And a lot of people who have been involved for that, uh, for that amount of time have, uh, have expressed growing concerns. And I think uh, that's a, 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 a reason we are, we are organizing this event to not just discuss what's going on in Georgia, but as I said, uh, whether the United States should be involved and how. Um, I, mean, I, should, I don't need to sum up some of the, um, some of the developments of the last few years, but obviously there is, a, from I think 2018 onward and the presidential election, uh, concern about elements of the Georgian political process. In 2019 we had the unrest uh, following an incident in parliament where a Russian uh, parliamentarian took over the speaker's chair and how those uh, protests were handled by the government. We also had the issue of the electoral law, which uh, the government pro promised reform in and then went back on, which led to a, to a uh, political uh, stalemate, I would say, between the government and the opposition. And obviously also the prosecution and a lot of people would say harassment of some opposition leaders. And a general sense in polls that have been coming out in the past few months of a very rapidly growing dissatisfaction among the Georgian population uh, at the same time that there is really no clear political alternative either. Um, that's uh, one of the reasons we brought a panel, which is not yet complete, but which features uh, people who know a lot about Georgia, but also who were involved in the U U.S. government at times when the United States took a very active role in uh, engaging with the Georgian uh, uh, leadership government in partnership, I would say, with the Georgian government and leadership. Um, we have Anthony Boyer, who uh, wrote, uh, has been working now for a quarter of a century, I believe, for IFAS, and um, has been involved in many iterations of, uh, of Georgian elections over the past decades. Um, ambassador Miles, of course, uh, was ambassador to Georgia uh, at one of the most dramatic moments at the time of the Rose Revolution, and can tell us about uh, how the U.S. government um, thought about Georgia at the time, and how what informed the different decisions about how to get involved in the process that led up to, to those very uh, difficult times. Uh, and Mr. Carpenter obviously worked in the Obama administration during the, I would say, equally complicated period of the cohabitation between uh, a UNM president and the Georgian Dream government. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand our uh, our um, our uh, the floor over to to our speakers. I think we agreed that Anthony will take the start and give us a, a few words about his uh, view of the current situation. We hope then that Ambassador Miles, you would be sharing your recollections of that period with us. And then we'll pass the floor on to Mr. Carpenter as he can tell us about his experience and also we'll have a discussion about uh, where we go from here. Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you, Swante. Thank you very much indeed. And um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'll try to keep my remarks relatively brief. I know there is interest in a discussion uh, at the end of the session uh, after all the panelists have spoken. Uh, I think it goes without saying, um, and I don't need to tell everybody in this room, that the, the, the current political situation in Georgia is certainly tense. Uh, it's extremely polarized. Uh, we have a, a case where uh, we've had a, a number of entreaties on the reforming the electoral system, um, which have not materialized. Um, and the discussions on uh, looking ahead at how we can further affect electoral legal changes has, in fact, stalled and been frozen. Uh, and certainly this stems back from the concessions made after the aforementioned Gavrilov episode of June of last year, in which the concession by the ruling party to, uh, among other things, um, to agree to full proportional elections for 2020 
uh, was summarily and later rejected in the Parliament uh, by was then termed renegade members or MPs of the Georgian Green uh, Coalition. Uh, obviously, the, the 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 entire notion of of, of slipping in a, a or, or or insert. A, of uh, insisting upon uh, a change to electoral system based on a very, it was a very emotional event, it was a, a strategic uh, um, device used by the opposition to try and get this, uh, this, this promise upheld or to get this concession upheld. It, certainly full proportionality was a, a long time interest of the political opposition. Um, I say that knowing that the former ruling party was at the, the head of this and they themselves had, at times been uh, accused of perhaps not negotiating in good faith with electoral reform. Um, and certainly, why do we want to have these changes to the electoral system? Um, first of all, they're difficult to implement because they do require constitutional uh, amendments, as opposed to election law changes, which would require a majority in, in, in Parliament as separate from the Constitution. So it's, it's a, a, certainly a big deal. Um, at the same time, uh, we know that the, the, the system, the election that we had, the last parliamentary election, produced a result that perhaps was incongruent um, in terms of the number of, of members of, of parliament uh, versus the proportion that the, uh, the parties that ascended the 5% threshold actually attained. So, again, um, not news to anybody in here, but a, a, a Georgian dream led supermajority not congruent, certainly, with the uh, proportional representation results versus the majoritarian results by which the ruling party uh, prevailed with a large number. And I would, argue, I would say as well that the UNM um, uh, benefited in the same manner during elections in its day. So um, where are we at the moment? Well, we, we've, since that rejection in, in, in Parliament of the full proportionality, we've had uh, different offers made to, uh, by way of compromise to try and get through this, this impasse. Uh, and set course for an election in 2020, which uh, would be more uh, viewed as more representative of, of public will uh, and, and the, the current political spectrum. Um, unfortunately, those different entreaties have not been approved. There was one that the opposition countered with, the so-called German model. Um, we can talk about that in more detail if anyone likes. I don't think Swati want me to go through the details of it. But suffice it to say, the, the model is... Um, uh, uh, is, uh, is determined, the, the winners of, of the election for this are determined in a more proportional manner, i.e. Uh, the number of seats uh, won through proportional representation is based on the total number of mandates in the entire parliament and not the, um, the 77. We currently have 77 seats determined by proportional representation of 150, 73 by the single mandate majoritarian component, again, as mentioned, which the ruling party has prevailed in. Um, this, uh, this system uh, wasn't accepted by the ruling party. Um, some suggest that uh, Jordan Green would not have um, w would not have been in its, in its interest to adopt it, uh, as it certainly would have lessened its number of mandates in Parliament. But there was a counter proposal that was also rejected in this case by the opposition, in which uh, there would be 50 mandates uh, that would be elected via majoritarian voting, and 100 by proportional representation. However, this, unlike the German model, which um, uh, was determined would be in compliance with the Constitution, this 5100 uh, variant would uh, not be in, in compliance. Ergo, we would still need a constitutional uh, amendment for that system to be approved. But at the end of the day, where we sit now, we have the same system, 77, 73, and we don't see any movement happening at this point. Um, and we're in this stalemate. I would say that the, the, what, what could be done in terms of um, how to still address some of the many issues with the election code, uh, many of these were identified in the last OSCE OGIR report in the last parliamentary elections. Uh, many of those issues also reappeared during the presidential election two years ago or so. Um, these are issues that could still be worked on. For example, uh, during election day, we, we, we see a, a great a preponderance of party or candidate supporters lingering outside of polling stations. Uh, this has the effect at times of intimidating voters or giving the perception that there's a, a, a system of controlling voters going on or some kind of um, malfeasance. 
Um, this is an issue that the, 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 the opposition and the government, pro-government parties agree on can be addressed. Um, but we now have a situation where the well appears to be poisoned a bit. Uh, there are other issues in terms of, of um, uh, regulations on political finance, on um, uh, electoral dispute resolution that can be fine-tuned um, to make it a, a more uh, fair, competitive process. Um, but unfortunately, in, in, in despite the best efforts of, um, of, of uh, the U.S. government and European governments to try to kickstart this process, we're, we're at a bit of an impasse. Uh, I would say that the, the recent uh, re-arrest of Mr. Ugalava has probably solidified positions on uh, the opposition side in terms of, of, of cooperation. Um, but uh, we still need to find a common ground to move forward. It is quite clear that the electoral system at this point, less than a year until the election, is not going to change. Um, there still is the possibility that we could have improvements to how elections are administered, uh, and this remains where we're at at this particular juncture. Now, I would say that um, it, it, when looking at the, the overall environment, the, uh, the non-governmental community has also been quite vocal, and, and at times perhaps politicized to a degree in terms of how it's viewing um, the, the current political dialogue. Um, there have been reports that, in fact, um, there have been attempts at, uh, uh, in some ways, discrediting certain non-governmental organizations who have been critical of the process. Um, this is, uh, there have been specific episodes, maybe, where uh, particular acts of intimidation have been, have been used. Uh, nonetheless, I think we need to realize that civil society has always been uh, the, the, the backbone of, of uh, Georgian democracy, really holding the government accountable, keeping a, a, a check and a watch on the performance of government and all the political uh, parties and uh, political entities in the country. Uh, and is certainly, again, after the Rose Revolution, regained its role and then after a Georgian dream came to power, has reconstituted as really serving a very key, key uh, role in, uh, in terms of the, uh, of the Georgian political scene. Um, now, as mentioned, the, the, the efforts to when we look at what the U.S. should do, um, and the international community, generally speaking, I, again, I think there's much to be done to continue to engage and encourage uh, both the opposition and Georgian Dream to get back to the negotiating table in good faith. I think we don't have a good faith situation right now. We have also perhaps a lack of political will to move the needle very far uh, on either side. Um, that said, uh, if you if you to, to, to take away um, the, the, the political discussions and, and, and ask people what they think by and large, um, you would see first of all that none of these parties has a, uh, a a huge degree of support based on surveys conducted by groups such as IRN and NDI, with whom my organization works very closely. Um, and so there's not a party that's running away in terms of its popularity in the country right now. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done by the political parties themselves. Uh, and here we are nine or less than nine months now until the election. And what the parties need to be working on is looking at, at addressing the, the many issues that have been identified as key to, to voters. The economy, unemployment. Uh, to name a couple. Uh, the, the list goes on. These are not new issues in Georgia, but they've certainly come to the fore uh, more recently. Um, and uh, what the U.S. government and the, the embassy have done and, and, and the Europeans is try to broker discussions. Um, as we know, there have been letters written by members of, of, uh, of, of Congress in the U.S. that have um, uh, cautioned our, uh, their counterparts in, in Georgia for uh, uh, possible democratic backsliding. Uh, so there's certainly a, a, a level of concern in Washington over what it sees as uh, the, the, the environment deteriorating somewhat for, for democracy and, and frankly the, the perceived outlook on the, on the elections this year. Um, as well, the um, uh, Western European uh, governments and European Parliament in particular have talked about things such as selective justice and persecution so clearly there's concern in Western capitals as well over what has been transpiring uh, over the last several months. Um, if we're to look at, uh, kind of go beyond the, the, the political rhetoric and, and get back to some of these issues where 
perhaps the different parties and political interests can coalesce and find common ground to discuss, uh, uh, in particular related to the elections, things that can be uh, worked on and compromised on. I think there are, there are several, what I would call, imminent threats to the elections in Georgia this October. Um, and for one, I would say uh, we, we certainly have the, the threat of cyber attack on the election process. Um, the, the Central Election Commission uh, has been working diligently to upgrade its cyber defenses uh, in terms of requiring hardware and software and training to train uh, election officers and, and uh, uh, at all levels in Georgia and to upgrade the general readiness uh, to fend off attacks as, such as we've seen in other countries. Uh, perpetrated um, for, uh, most in many cases from outside the country. We also have, um, I think, a real threat, uh, as we saw in the presidential election, of uh, disinformation, uh, particularly through social media. And I would say that uh, I would take it to another level of, of uh, outright hate speech against certain candidates and political entities. Um, I think this remains, uh, a, 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 it's becoming a very much of a, uh, a, a larger threat as days go by. Social media continues to be uh, one of the key avenues of information uh, that Georgians of all backgrounds access to find out news and to, to learn about the political situation in the country. Um, I think in, in that token, we also have a, a, a certainly, as the survey results uh, indicate, a degree of apathy among Georgian voters now and a sense of, of, of cynicism at, at the, uh, the, the, uh, the lack of, of uh, of, of productive dialogue. And quite frankly, I mean, is coming to an agreement on the election system really going to, to move the needle of public opinion? I mean, I, I don't think that's going to be a big issue that people rally around. I think how that issue is projected to Georgian voters, i.e., do we have a system whereby uh, all of the political parties uh, have an equal opportunity, do we have, uh, uh, in which uh, voters, all voters in Georgia, have a right for their voices to be heard. And this gets to my next point, and I, I think, uh, and I hope that this would be the year in which some of the um, disadvantaged or the traditionally marginalized communities, particularly the ethnic minority groups, were more included in the decision-making process. Uh, that women were more included, more represented in, in, in Parliament. Um, we, we certainly know of the, uh, the, the efforts before to uh, provide a, a, a bonus and uh, state funding for those parties who had I think 30% of women on their party list, uh, most parties adhere to this. Um, but th there are still marginalized and really orphaned communities in Georgia that are not being included in the greater discussions, the greater political process, uh, and other, 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 uh, other uh, underrepresented groups such as uh, persons with disabilities and, uh, and, and certainly young people who would have to be the, uh, the lifeblood of this democracy going forward. Uh, I, I think that parties need to realize that there's time that is wasting right now. Um, there are many issues in society. Yes, we, we have to talk about the big issues as well. Um, at this point, though, the system is not going to change. Uh, I do believe that um, the, uh, the, there, there's still an honest, uh, an honest intention to have full proportionality at some point. We, it had been suggested that 2024 would be the opportunity. Uh, certainly that's not going to satisfy the opposition, which had uh, counted on 2020, offering that, that possibility. Um, in terms of uh, the final points, I think the, the, um, the key again is for both sides to, in spite of what's taking place, both sides need to continue or to try to negotiate in good faith. Um, it's uh, difficult when you're sitting across the table from members of one part or the other to say that and have them accept it. Uh, I don't see it other way forward. I think we have uh, certainly preponderance of demonstrations taking place in Tbilisi. Uh, I don't know how long these demonstrations can last and whether or not they can make the critical difference. If we look back at June of 2019, those demonstrations and what happened certainly raised public ire. Uh, again, though, was it organized around uh, the, the, uh, the an opportunity to change the election system or a more emotional um, uh, viewpoint of the Gavrilov presence in the parliamentary speaker's chair. Um, so I think parties have to be pragmatic about how they look at things going forward. Uh, certainly, I, I, there are those who predict um, uh, difficult days ahead. 
I think it's a test of Georgia's democracy to uh, work to overcome these while promoting as open and inclusive election process as possible. Um, we'll see what happens. I should say, full disclosure, I work for an organization that's funded by USAID, which has an agreement with the government of Georgia uh, to implement democracy reforms in the country. Um, our organization works with all political actors. Uh, uh, I would mention that, uh, <coughs> including the uh, Patriots Alliance and, and, and all uh, parties along the spectrum, uh, hopefully there will, be, uh, uh, there will be a collective will, a political will to move forward. But uh, at this point, I think we've seen more regression than progress, at least in the past few weeks. I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you Anthony. Before handing uh, the floor to you, Ambassador, I'd like to just raise one issue, since we might get carried away with some of the electoral issues later. Now, we, you mentioned that we have a system that does not represent accurately, and we've had it for a long time. I mean, some of the majoritarians uh, that we talk about in the Georgian parliament, I think, are the same people who were in the Shavarnaza period and the Sahakashvili period. I'm sure, Ambassador, you would recognize some of them if you went back to Georgia today. Uh, so we can all agree on that, that this is a suboptimal situation. On the other hand, when we have full proportionality on the agenda, Israel has full proportionality. They're what, in their third election in the year right now? I come from Sweden, which has full proportionality. And Georgia, by the way, I, I think now is removing the, uh, the threshold. At least Sweden has a 4% threshold. Uh, it took them, what, 300, 200 something days or maybe less to form a government last year. I mean, and you get these totally deadlocked parliaments. Should we really want countries to have full proportionality? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should want for political interest to be represented. I mean, any time you have, um, uh, again, looking at the numbers the, the, on the surface, how majoritarian seats have been won in Georgia, uh, you know, typically by the ruling party, and when you add simply these figures to what is a mixed system, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's disproportionate. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many negatives to, to, uh, into looking at full proportionality. There are countries who've gone back and forth in terms of the mixture. Mm -hmm. uh, I would name Kyrgyzstan as one mm -hmm. that uh, has gone back and forth on what uh, threshold you would have, what barrier, uh, what percentage of majoritarian seats. Armenia, we have a, a case where there, uh, among its, its party list vote, you have a secondary vote for individual members mm -hmm. of that party, so sort of a district proportionality. Um, trust me, you didn't want to sit through a vote count in that you know, <laughs> country too often. Um, so there's, there's not an ideal, but I, I think the, the, the point is we have to be talking about what the ideal is, right? I mean, we had two options, um, which you might suggest are, are uh, progressive in terms of the 5100 option or the German model, which were rejected. I don't think, I don't know how seriously they were, fact, they were in fact taken um, because of the poisoned political waters right now in the country. So it, the point is, let's get back to a discussion of what, what, what might be possible, what might be uh, satisfactory, and continue having these discussions. Unfortunately, we're at a point where no one is uh, really, at this point, eager to engage with the other side. Um, but indeed so. I mean, we have, um, uh, again, there's no perfect system, I think you would say. Thank you. Would you pass the mic for you? Ambassador Miles, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can people in the back hear okay? Great, good sound system. Mr. Ambassador, good to see you always. Um, except for the details on the parliamentary system that Anthony was talking about, as he talked, I, I kept wondering, is he talking about the United States or is he talking about Georgia? We also have our political problems in this country. I can remember very well uh, an article I did once that was in a Russian magazine right after I left in 2005, left Georgia in 2005. And uh, I did say, and the headline of the article was, maybe the process of democratization was oversold. And my boss at that time, I was working for the Open World Leadership Center out of the Library of Congress, and Jim Billington called me into his office <laughs> and said, did you really say that? <laughs> and I did, I have to admit. Well, democratization, you know, the process of democratic development, it's a, it's a messy business and it has its ups and downs. Um, I just read a new uh, biography of Samuel Pepys, who was a, um, a, a British um, bureaucrat uh, writ large in the 17th century, and he kept immaculate diaries. Um, 
some of these things which we're discussing today uh, were very evident at that time in England um, more than 300 years ago. In fact, worse because uh, there were one king had his head chopped off, uh, another was exiled. Um, it was a extraordinarily messy time, and I guess that's I guess that's part of the of the process. Um, I'll go back in time a little bit, and I won't talk really about what is happening today in Georgia. I do stay in touch uh, through friends and uh, colleagues and through uh, social media, um, but I'm not in any way an expert on Georgia today, and so I'm not going to really talk about Georgia today, but I'll just go into a little bit of the electoral process um, back before the Rose Revolution. I may say a few words about the Rose Revolution, but not very much. I really want to talk about the electoral process. Um, it was a difficult time. Um, I think we tend to forget sometimes, especially in America, maybe not in Georgia, but in America we tend to forget that the November 2003 election, which led to the Rose Revolution, was a parliamentary election. It was not a presidential election. Um, and uh, in, a, in a way it was rather odd that, it, that things turned out the way they did, but um, Saakashvili, who had many faults of course, but he also was very astute politically and he sensed that people were <coughs> upset with the condition of things as they should have been. And so almost immediately, uh, and somewhat to the, certainly to the surprise, and somewhat to the dismay of his um, his colleagues, uh, Nino Borgianazzi and Zrobb uh, uh, Zrania, um, he began calling for President uh, Saakashvili's resignation. And that caught on with the people, and next thing you know, uh, President Shevardnadze has uh, resigned and President Saakashvili is in. Uh, a new chapter of Georgian history. It all came about because of that flawed election in 2003. Um, I'll use the word we a lot as I describe what was going on, but when I when I say we, it wasn't just the United States. Uh, it was truly a, a, a combined effort of a lot of people, non-governmental organizations, political parties in Georgia, and the international community. Um, we all realized that that election was going to be an extraordinarily important one, and indeed it was. Um, we, uh, we formed an organization of, uh, an ad hoc organization of those ambassadors of countries in Georgia who, who had the ability to play some role in the process leading up to the election. The Americans perhaps spent more money than other countries did, but there was a lot of international money that was also spent, and not just by countries like Great Britain or France or Germany or Italy, but also by uh, the international institutions, by the EC, by the UNDP. In fact, the ambassadors uh, and representatives of these international organizations would meet once a week to, to see how things were going to try to avoid duplication of efforts and to try to fill in places where not enough was being done. And that meeting was chaired by the uh, United Nations uh, Development Program, UNDP representative in, in Georgia. Um, the Russians and the Chinese were invited to belong to this ad hoc um, organization. And the Russian ambassador sometimes attended. I don't believe the Chinese ambassador ever attended. And I don't think the Russians and certainly not the Chinese ever spent any particular money in the process of trying to help the electoral process along. But what did, what did we actually do? Um, the Americans especially spent a really a lot of money helping the Georgian authorities to um, put the handwritten voter registration rolls on computers to computerize it. Uh, we found a lot of duplication, we found a lot of uh, people on there who had died. Um, it was a Herculean effort it involved scores of young Georgian students. Uh, we hired a, uh, a vacant warehouse um, 
bought a very large number of computers. They were more expensive then than they are now, and trained uh, young Georgians how to work them. And then we acquired the handwritten voter registration rolls, sometimes typed, sometimes in handwriting, from all over the country, and systematically put them into the computer so that everyone in Georgia, um, with access to a computer, could share those roles and could challenge uh, people who should not have been registered or could say, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm not registered, why is that? So I think that was a, a significant effort. In the end, uh, on election day, it was sometimes used and sometimes not used, I have to admit that, but it was a lot of money that was spent, and I think spent very well, very wisely. Uh, we also uh, helped um, to fund, through Agency for International Development, uh, democracy, reform money, um, to bring in outside experts, which were available for all of the political parties in Georgia, the government party and the opposition parties, and even those parties which uh, were a little bit at odds with each other in the opposition. I'm sure you know that even during the Rose Revolution, some of the significant Georgian political parties did not support uh, the demonstrations on the street, but we provided this expertise to all of the parties that wanted to participate, that wanted to take part of it, part in it. Uh, we also contracted with uh, an American political organization, the name of which escapes me, to provide training for um, people to, um, who were uh, capable of conducting uh, exit polling. That had not been done in Georgia before on a formal basis, um, informally, yes, but not on a formal basis. And the results of that um, exit polling was extremely valuable when our first criticisms of the um, flawed election uh, began to be shared with the uh, Georgian authorities. Uh, and in fact, uh, the figures which were collected in the exit polling, I think, turned out to be amazingly accurate. And so that was, again, a valuable thing. We uh, set up classes. Uh, for leaders of the uh, political parties on how to conduct electoral campaigns, how to speak in public, how to do television advertising. It was really um, an across-the-board effort. I, I frankly don't know much else that could have been done that was not being done at that time. Um, I myself uh, spent a fair amount of time talking not only to people in power, which of course is what ambassadors are supposed to do, but also to people who clearly were in opposition, including um, talking to some of the uh, opposition political leaders uh, out in the provinces, and um, I guess in a sense the word warning would not be too strong, warning them that in a way their, their future reputations were on the line. Um, the way they handle things in their provinces, and I'm talking about the opposition, not about the government, but the way they handled themselves in opposition, you know, would be looked at very carefully. And should the opposition be successful in uh, commanding a majority of the parliamentary seats, this would be something which we in the United States government would uh, take notice of. I'm not sure that that had a whole lot of effect, but it, it shows you the efforts to which I personally went, which maybe were a little bit beyond what an ambassador would ordinarily do in a, in a reasonably democratic country like Georgia. Um, was that interfering in internal affairs of Georgia? And in a sense, yes. But really a lot was at stake, you know. I can remember very clearly um, uh, when there was a difficulty with the um, uh, membership on the Central Election Commission. Um, uh, things had reached an impasse and ta uh, passions were running reasonably high, I think, and it prevented people from talking to each other in the manner in which you suggest would be a very useful thing to do, and of course it would be a useful thing to do. Um, no one seemed to be able to break this impasse and it, it might have caused the election to be postponed. In the end, it might not have been that important a thing, but it seemed important at the time. Uh, and so uh, someone in Washington, I would like to be able to claim it, but I, it was not my idea, 
someone in Washington had the really uh, good idea of asking uh, former Secretary of State Baker if he would come out to Georgia to uh, see what he could do to help uh, the opposition leaders and uh, the government authorities uh, break this impasse. And Baker agreed to do it. Baker was an excellent choice for this role. He had worked closely with Shevardnadze uh, when Shevardnadze was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. And I think they were close personal friends. Um, Baker's an extremely intelligent man. Um, he thought of a possible solution on the airplane coming out. Now here's a man who had paid no attention to this whatsoever, probably until he got on the airplane. And yet he came up with a solution which in the end was adopted, which none of us in Georgia, Georgian foreign diplomats, whatever, had been able to come up with, with all of our experience. That just shows you how smart a man he is. Uh, but the important thing to me was a conversation that he had, and I was present, um, in which after discussing some energy issues, we had a problem with the American energy company, AES, at that time. I won't go into that as little to do with the election process. But he <coughs> mentioned to the Nazi the importance which the United States attached to the honest conduct of the uh, parliamentary election. And he emphasized it. And uh, President Sherman Nazi said, so uh, Jim, he, they were on first name basis, uh, that means that the way in which we conduct these elections will determine um, your future attitude toward us after the election. And Baker said, uh, yes, Edward, uh, that's exactly right. And of course, in a way, that is what happened. So. Is that pressure? Yes, uh, it is. And frankly, I don't, I don't quite know why President Sherman Nazi, for whom I had actually great respect and, and I, mean, I would think a measure of friendship, actually. Uh, I don't quite know why um, he, he didn't keep better control of the electoral process or even maybe encouraged uh, some of these faults, which developed. Um, I spoke to people who were closely allied with him after the whole process and um, their answer I think is probably accurate. He, he simply wanted to try to extend his political influence even though he realized he would no longer be president after, uh, when was the presidential election? 2005 I think even after the presidential election, he wanted to maintain his influence in the parliament. And that's, that's why he did not keep better control of events. In the end, it caused his premature uh, resignation. Um, that's a hell of a way to end a career uh, such as he had. And then we had President Saakashvili to deal with. I won't uh, really go into detail about the Rose Revolution. I can answer questions about it if you like later on. But it was certainly a new chapter in uh, Georgian history and it all came about, if not, it might have come about later, but it did come about because of that flawed parliamentary election in 2003. So anyone who thinks elections are not important, well, first of all, they can look at what's happening in the United States today. But secondly, they can look at what happened in Georgia in 2003. It could not have been more important. Thank you. Thank you, Buster. Mike, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Well, that's an excellent segue, I think, into talking about the 2012 election. And I should note that I was um, working in government, but I was not working on Georgia in 2012. Uh, I think Wendy Silverman and others uh, here in the room who were actually focused on Georgia policy at the time may actually know the details uh, far better than I do. Uh, but I've followed Georgia ever since, and of course it's a cliche to say that every election is pivotal and a litmus test of such and such country's democracy. Uh, except that it happens to be true this time, as it was in 2003 and as it was in 2012. Um, what struck me about the administration's, then the Obama uh, administration's attitude towards this election was um, the fact that our leverage, I think, at the time, U.S. leverage in Georgia was at its, close to its peak. 
um, we really had enormous influence over the Saakashvili team. We didn't like everything they were doing, certainly by 2012. Uh, you know, remember, uh, Macho Akalaya was the Minister of Interior. I think people here in Washington were aware of his various shenanigans and did not, sorry to be undiplomatic, but did not think highly of him and saw him as a threat to Georgian democracy. Uh, the Prime Minister at the time was Vano Maravishvili, who uh, may be a bit of a smoother operator, but also had a, a, a very uh, problematic uh, relationship with Washington, and opinions of him here were, uh, were quite harsh uh, at the time. And so the administration, I think, wanted to very much, very similar, to what Jim Baker conveyed to Shevardnadze as you've recounted it, Ambassador, very much wanted to put the Saakashvili uh, government on notice. And so as I was looking back, I saw you know, a quote from Secretary of State Clinton, who met with Saakashvili and publicly said in June of 2012, the single best thing Georgia can do to advance your security, your prosperity, your democracy, your international reputation is to hold free and fair elections that result in a fully democratic transition. Now, she used the word democratic transition as if she were presupposing that the Saakashvili party and team, UNM, would lose. So she was essentially saying, we think you're going to have a transition, and you better damn sure get it right and ensure that it is peaceful and smooth and democratic. Um, now, at the time, I think it's also worth recalling um, that Benzina Ivanashvili and his supporters had claimed that their activists were being harassed uh, and that they were battling an unfair media environment, um, uh, there were restrictive rules on campaign financing, um, and that led some members of the Ivanashvili team at the time to say before the election that the election was going to be stolen. Right, so this, this, you see the parallels, for example, with uh, the United States in 2016. Uh, already in advance of the election, a claim the election is, is, is going to be uh, stolen and casting doubt on the legitimacy of the election. Um, now, the election occurred. Uh, it was deemed by the OSCE, despite some irregularities, uh, to be mostly uh, free and fair. Uh, but then, uh, it's also worth recalling what happened in the immediate aftermath of that election uh, in uh, early October of 2012, where um, Central Election Commission of Georgia at the time uh, reported that uh, GD supporters were threatening the work of various officials, electoral officials, uh, election uh, administration officials, uh, and nearly a dozen district headquarters they were demanding that the election officials reverse so-called quote-unquote fraudulent vote counts uh, that had resulted for uh, victories for UNM candidates in those particular precincts. Now, um, the international response at the time was fairly stiff. So the EU mission chief at the time, Philip Dimitrov, uh, warned that such threats against election officials in Georgia reflected badly on party leaders didn't mince his words. Uh, our ambassador at the time, Dick Norland, uh, traveled to Zugdidi, excuse me, uh, to urge uh, GD supporters uh, protesting a local win by a UNM candidate uh, to respect the democratic process, to stay in their lane. They could complain, they could go through the procedures, but you know, don't uh, cast aspersions on the legitimacy of the process unless you have proof, go through the proper channels. Um, that's 2012. Um, we all know how it turned out. I think right now we are in a slightly different situation in that I don't think uh, U.S. influence, Western influence in Georgia are as, um, are as high, are as strong as they were in 2012. Um, and, uh, you know, my reason for making this claim has to do with a number of events that have happened over the last couple of years. Um, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that we had an ambassadorial candidate to Georgia, highly respected uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Bridget Brink, uh, who had not yet formally been announced, but who we had floated to the Georgian government. 
as our potential uh, ambassador nominee and encountered widespread opposition from uh, the powers that be in Georgia, from, um, from the government, from officials, uh, against her nomination. That nomination languished for well over a year until finally it was withdrawn. Um, and only now, only very recently, have we had uh, an ambassador uh, in place in Georgia. We've dealt with charges, various acting officials, uh, uh, for the better part of, I think, over two years, actually. Yeah. Um, so the reason I bring this up, though, is because it's, it, you know, it was striking to me that a U.S. ambassadorial nominee could get effectively blocked by the other side. And I think it was unconscionable, frankly, with all due respect, Mr. Ambassador, for our State Department to sit by and take that blockage. I think uh, we should have insisted on our candidate. If they wanted to veto her through formal channels, so be it. But she should have, she was our choice and she would have been a great ambassador, in fact. Uh, not to say that Kelly Degnan is not a great ambassador. I met with her before she left. For Tbilisi, I think she's um, uh, incredibly smart, knows the region well, and she'll do very well in her position. But the point is that it was unacceptable to allow that to happen, and it shows how U.S. influence uh, in Georgia has, has decreased. Uh, another example is recent criticism of the polling work done by IRI and NDI. Now, uh, I think in this room, it can be pretty widely accepted that the work that NDI and IRI uh, do around the world is, by and large, beyond reproach. Someone may be able to point to a few instances of something that was unprofessional, but generally speaking, their reputation here is as sterling as you get. Um, and Democrats think highly of IRI, and Republicans think highly of NDI, because the work they do tends to be nonpartisan out in the field of promoting democracy. And so to have criticism of their polling, uh, of their uh, professional, methodologically sound polling results in Georgia as somehow reflecting a bias against the ruling party, uh, again, shows a willingness to challenge the U.S. in ways that we haven't seen uh, before. And then um, I think, you know, probably the most dramatic um, example to my mind of the diminished uh, influence or respect for, for the U.S. and for Western institutions in Georgia is a story that surfaced, um, oh gosh, I guess in the last part of last year, in the fall of, late fall of 2019, when Facebook and the Atlantic Council did some research showing that there was an entity in Georgia that was sowing um, anti-US, anti-NATO disinformation on social media. Um, and that entity turned out to have been financed by the Georgian Dream Party. So it was not Georgian Dream directly, but it was an entity that had secured financing for them, according to these reports, uh, which, if they are correct, again, underscores um, not just diminished U.S. influence, but actually a desire to sort of challenge uh, the hitherto consensual agreement among almost all parties in Georgia, the exception maybe the Alliance of Patriots, that Euro and Euro-Atlantic integration was the um, uh, unanimous uh, choice of all of Georgia's leading politicians. Um, or at least it was, you know, if there was some Machiavellian reason behind it that was supposed to support Euro-Atlantic integration, it sure as hell didn't come through. Um, and then lastly, the canceling of the Anaklia deep water port, which, of course, I recognize that there are a variety of of reasons uh, why this happened. It's not uh, simple, black and white, but at the end of the day, a major U.S. investment, a strategic investment uh, that would have developed Georgia's east-west transportation corridor um, uh, and been a visible sign of U.S. commitment to the region was undone. And again, uh, there may be valid reasons why it was undone. I'm not someone who is an expert on the details, but it but the way in which it was done, the way in which the tender was canceled, the way in which some of the money laundering allegations against some of the consortium uh, participants dating back to 2011, as I recall, were sort of brought forward on earth, um, was frankly a bit of a slap in the face to this notion that the U.S. was going to be a strategic partner. 
And so what we've seen is we've seen criticism of these moves. Uh, we've seen criticism of the decision by uh, the ruling party to backtrack on its commitment to proportional representation, which, you know, plenty of systems with mixed uh, type of electoral uh, systems, some proportional, some single mandate. Um, but what we see here in Georgia is, let's be brutally frank, it's a pattern, or at least it's a data point that fits a pattern that we've seen across the region that extends well beyond Georgia, whereby salami slice by salami slice, state capture is enabled by a gradual incremental tinkering with democratic institutions. No single act of which is undemocratic or even necessarily illegal. And by the way, the same is true of Poland under the Law and Justice Party or Hungary under Orban. No single act in itself is illegal, but the composite picture is one of tilting the, the playing field uh, to support uh, incumbents. Um, the, uh, the decision to appoint uh, Prime Minister Gakaria, a, a very capable uh, politician, but in the aftermath of the Gavrilov protests, uh, was also a bit of a, well, it was, let's put it this way, regardless of where you sit, it was perceived by the opposition and by the, the folks in Georgia who had come out onto the streets as a slap in the face. Um, since he was the one who had led uh, the crackdown um, uh, when those protests occurred. And again, not to say that people don't have a right to freedom of peaceful assembly and that when they transgress that right, that authorities don't have a right to crack down and prevent their parliament building from being overrun and so on and so forth. Yes, all of the above. Uh, but this was a symbolic step as well. Uh, and then finally, the... Um, the indictment of former mayor uh, Ugalava. Uh, again, I'm not. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an expert on his case. Uh, well, I don't know if he's guilty or innocent. Uh, but what I do know is that a major opposition leader has been indicted and is going to go to jail for the second time on the same charges, stemming from an act committed in I think it was 2011, if I'm not mistaken, on the eve of a parliamentary election. So. Um, from the Washington perspective, it certainly does not look uh, good. It looks like um, there is a doubling down on um, tilting the playing field to favor uh, the ruling party and, um, and an increasing lack of willingness to listen to US voices. And this is the critical difference with 2012 and 2003, which I think is dangerous now. And I think it needs to be underscored by this administration, uh, and if not by the administration, then by leaders in Congress, as we are seeing, fortunately, um, that this is really, this is pivotal. This is make or break for Georgia's relationship with the United States. Uh, ruling uh, party in Georgia uh, has sovereign control of the institution's uh, governance. It can do what it wants uh, on its sovereign territory. That is the decision of the government, and then Georgia's citizens will react how they do. But we have to be clear that our relationship will be impacted by how these elections are conducted in October. Uh, if there are irregularities, if there is wide-based patronage <coughs> voting and use of administrative resources and not just but potentially irregularities in the actual count, uh, it's going to affect not just Georgia's image in Washington, it's going to affect our bilateral relationship, the security relationship, uh, the economic relationship, all aspects of the relationship. Uh, and I think that's the point of these letters from uh, the members of the Georgia caucus in the House and Senate. I applaud them for taking a strong stand. I know it is uh, irritating um, for uh, Georgian officials in Tbilisi especially. Um, but, uh, you know, the problem is, is that this, you know, maybe 15 years ago we could have dismissed this as, well, let me rebut you on each one of those cases and argue why it's correct that the Georgian government took such and such move. But, you know, in the last 15 years we have a mountain of literature on um, state capture and the erosion of democratic norms. And we see this playbook being repeated in countries, as I mentioned, from... Hungary, Poland, uh, Moldova, 
uh, Ukraine, you name it. We've seen this time and again. And uh, we can't, we're not going to sit by and allow for state capture to happen if that is indeed <coughs> what happens, and maybe it won't. But if that is indeed what happens, uh, we can't sit idly by. We have to speak out. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think our, our three speakers have given us a lot of... Um, Thank you. I think you've given our, uh, our audience a lot of food for thought and for a discussion. And uh, I'd like to, um, to open up the floor. Uh, I'm not surprised to see Ambassador Bakradze. You are ready. Please. Uh, could somebody have, have this microphone around? We only have one on the plate. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to see the full room of uh, those who follow and, and are interested in the developments in Georgia. Uh, it's an important year. Uh, it's an election year. And uh, in Georgia, not surprisingly, uh, election year is, is as dense uh, as it one can imagine in a democratic country. Um, uh, we. Uh, let me start with uh, once again reassuring. They cannot hear me from there. If you can just move a little this way. Then. Ah, okay. Is that right? Perfect. Thank okay. you. Uh, this here is an election year, but the first let me uh, start with uh, responding to uh, what uh, Mike was uh, saying. Georgia and US relation is as strong as ever. Uh, we are proud uh, to be a strongest and the most reliable partner of the United States and its interest in our part of the world, be it in security, in defense, in uh, economic, and most importantly in the democratic transformation of our country. Uh, this is an uh, election year and I mention it again because sometimes uh, in the very harsh political environment uh, the sound bites and headlines dominate the discussion. and. Uh, Therefore, the context suffers, the facts are forgotten. So let me uh, a little bit uh, take time to uh, repeat some of the important facts. Uh, about the elections, uh, the promise uh, of the government, of uh, the ruling party, was to move to the proportional election. That was delivered through the uh, parliamentary elections, through the constitutional changes in 2017. So Georgia is moving to the, uh, first of all, parliamentary republic, fully parliamentary republic, and therefore uh, fully proportional uh, system of election starting uh, from 2024. Uh, this has happened uh, through the constitutional changes that uh, unilaterally by the ruling party, party that unfortunately wasn't supported by single opposition member uh, who has boycotted this process. So Georgian uh, people has uh, this transition to the parliamentary republic and proportional representation starting from uh, 2024. Uh, this is also uh, very important to note that uh, the notwithstanding the fact that there was a 12 votes short the voting for the uh, moving date from 2024 to 2020, the ruling party has presented, uh, I think, reasonable solution, transition to going to 2024, as presenting the option at 100 to 50. I would go to uh, what Anthony was mentioning about the German model and say that uh, it was by all the experts recognized as unconstitutional and therefore constitutional changes including this was sent to the OSC or DIR mission and therefore this will need a constitutional change. So it is important to note and realize that today in a very unfortunately very polarized environment that we face in Georgia uh, and therefore the threats of further instability that we face it is important that all the parties remain uh, around the dialogue table. Um, 
I want to, uh, as we are talking, what U.S. should do. In that context, uh, as uh, from the very first day, the new ambassador, uh, Ambassador Kelly Bergman, has started to engage uh, and strengthen the bilateral relations, including today uh, meeting with the opposition leaders to reiterate the importance of the dialogue uh, and importance of finding the solution. The compromise is on the table, and uh, it's very clear that it advances uh, and uh, makes it one step towards the fully proportional system, 100 to 50, comparing to 77 to 73, as it was, uh, as it is now. Uh, without constitutional changes, this is not happening. Therefore, opposition needs to support this step and therefore demonstrate the willingness to move forward with the uh, changes and move forward to the uh, political uh, resolution of uh, the situation. Um, I mention it because uh, we are living in the very difficult and turbulent environment. Therefore, any instability that may be caused around Georgia or in Georgia is something that is an opportunity to advance the interests from Russia that we face uh, is always using uh, its different tools to advance its political uh, interests. When we talk about the constitutional changes, I need to mention uh, and underline that during the constitutional changes of 2017, for the first time we have in the Constitution underlined the aspiration of our people and of our country to join European Union and NATO. The Euro-Atlantic aspiration is a constitutional norm, and this is a civilizational choice of our people. This is happening through the democratic changes, and those who remember 2012 understand and realize how advanced we are through the democratic changes, whether it's a freedom of expression, whether it's a media freedom, property rights, etc., etc. On every account of democratic transformation, Georgia has advanced. The system that is today, that unfortunately, if not changes, if changes don't take place uh, in the Constitution, that the elections will be held, is fully legitimate. This is the election through which, in 2012, Georgian people has made change through the ballot box in Georgia. But the difference is huge when it comes to the every account, every ranking, when it comes to democratic development of Georgia, where Georgia stands out not only from the region, but is ahead of several EU member states. A couple of uh, issues I don't want to, ask you to wrap up into, into the details, but, but I hope that I may have a possibility to answer on some of them. Sure. Thank you. Yes, sir, at the back. Thank you very much, uh, Paul Joel. Um, I've been going in and out of Georgia for those that uh, don't know me since 91. I was Shepard Downs' first lobbyist, and according to uh, Della Cecchiani's uh, memoirs, the first time he heard about the election of 2003 being rigged was from me when I agreed to Shepard Downs heard about this was unacceptable. But I want to talk about what Ambassador Miles did, which was extremely important, which was the exit poll. Because that was the basis of knowing that there was something very, very wrong. Now, I was also president in Georgia for 2012. And exit polling, once again, was extremely important, knowing that the Georgian dream had, in fact, won. A matter of fact, right after the polls closed, President Saakashvili went on television and announced that his political party had won. Now, no votes had been counted at that point, and UNM did not have uh, any polling outside the polls asking people how they voted. They had people outside the polls making notations of everyone that did vote, but they didn't have the exit poll. So exit polling is very important. It's extremely important. The night before the election, I had done a, a cyber investigation over a period of time of how 
Mr. Akalaya and the Constitutional Protection Department had placed malware on 50 computers of the Georgian Dream, turning on their microphones, their video cameras, etc. That was all briefed to the State Department with the forensic results. Nothing was stated, even though David Ignatius eventually wrote about it. So what I will say, you know, my point is, please get exit polling. Very important. But in terms of the allegations that the concern of Saakashvili stealing an election, I think, I think that it, it clearly was underway by that, by that press conference he had. And luckily, the exit polling uh, uh, saved the day in terms of guaranteeing an adequate result uh, for that election. Thank you. Just immediate reaction, sir. Just let me show. Very short. Very short, yes, which I failed to mention. This is important also, and, and to be mentioned that uh, the only recommendations, uh, they are in the parliament, the recommendations, and it is also important that not only the dialogue that takes place about the system, but also uh, making the election legislation uh, even more close to the European standards, and the only recommendations are there. And these amendments as a draft legislation is already in the parliament and therefore the spring session is very important to uh, move that agenda forward. Also, when we talk about the spring session and the constitutional changes, from the procedural point of view, it is very important to note that constitutional changes will take at least three months. So the room for the agreement is now. The room for the agreement is before the June in June, the parliament closes its spring session. Therefore, the agreement, and therefore, somehow reassuring that political parties sit around the table and agree on the system, on the compromise, whether it's suggested from one party or another, is critically important. And very briefly, to reflect on the Gulao case, which was mentioned by, by the numerous panelists. The fight against corruption is a critical part of this government's agenda, despite whether it's a uh, political season or not. What's doing right moving forward with that important is important, and that is reflected in decisions that were taken over the course of one year that didn't cause any attention, but two mayors of Georgia cities under GG government have been arrested, are serving seven, 12, and one deputy mayor two years for the similar charges on far more or less amount of amendments. <coughs> Would you like to respond to anything that was said? May I? Please, <coughs> Anthony, if you... I'm trying to get my vision back. It's a bright light coming out to me. Uh, thanks. Uh, just very briefly, um, I thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your comments and the gentleman in the back. I would only say I would agree 100%, and, and in fact, um, we hope that uh, the civil society organizations in order will be allowed um, to do their job uh, this year. They will be able to conduct exit polls, uh, monitor the media, uh, and uh, conduct other uh, appropriate investigations in terms of uh, political finance and so forth, working in tandem with authorities. Uh, for example, the Central Election Commission, which has made uh, enormous strides in terms of um, reaching out to non-governmental organizations um, and, and as well <coughs> conducting joint training with election management bodies at lower level. So uh, I would thank uh, both gentlemen for coming. Thank you. Further questions, arguments, protests? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Devin. I work for Georgian Media. Thank you very much for your thoughts. <coughs> uh, Mr. Carpenter, you mentioned I write in NDI. It would be a very hard job to find a person in Georgia who would be convinced that IRI or NDI, this organization, are the enemies of Georgia. <coughs> we know that those organizations are the biggest friends and they want to help us to thrive in the process of democracy. But I can help myself to ask you and hear your comment on Randy Shannon. I'm sure you heard this name. This is the person who is the vice president of IRI, and at the same time, he's an official lobbyist of the uh, United Nations uh, <coughs> movement in, in Washington, D.C. 
how this fact does look like for you? How, what, what do you have to say about this? <coughs> you mean a lobbyist not for the U United Nations, but for UNM? UNM, sorry, yeah, yes, okay. of course okay. not. Uh, <coughs> well, actually, I wasn't aware of that. Um, I generally tend to believe that when you work on a particular issue, you should not be lobbying uh, one of the parties in that issue. Uh, you should disassociate yourself so there's no conflict of interest. But I, I, I'm just simply not familiar with that situation. But I will use the fact that I have the microphone um, to say one additional thing, which I think is really important for this uh, election, and that gets at not just parallel vote counts um, uh, or tabulations, because those are important, but those can also be uh, circumvented. Uh, I think after the Orange Revolution, after uh, the Rose Revolution after 2012, I think sophisticated governments know how to do things so that uh, those parallel vote tabulations are not quite as effective as they have been in the past, which is not to say they shouldn't be done. But what, here's what I think should be done. I think in advance of this pivotal election, uh, I think uh, the international community needs to flood the zone with OSCE observers, short-term monitors, long-term monitors, NDI, IRI, let's get a Senate-led um, uh, election observation mission to actually travel to Tbilisi with some high-profile uh, folks. I know, uh, I think McCain and Shaheen in the past have gone. Uh, I think people of that stature going again would be very helpful. Uh, and I think, frankly, a visit by Pompeo uh, in the run-up to the election uh, to talk about all the achievements and the positives in the U.S.-Georgia relationship, of which there are many, and the ambassador mentioned some. Uh, but then also to lay down this very clear marker in terms of expectations of, of what comes next. Thank you. Um, I think that there may, I, Mr. Scheunemann's name was mentioned. We may have in the audience an associate with Mr. Scheunemann who might be willing to, to address that question, or perhaps they're not there. Yes, would you like to? Uh, what, was it? what was the question? The question was about Mr. Scheunemann being with the IRI as a vice president and also being a lobbyist. <coughs> No comment. Uh, I don't think there's Why not? Any, I don't think there's any conflict of interest in uh, the IRI board. Uh, many of you are familiar with them. Would make sure that uh, you know there was no. How the public should be reassured about the conflict. Of I just think transparency. Just a clear transparency and a trust, or you know, okay. okay. Well, can I actually, so I, I don't want to say anything specifically about the Schoenemann case since I, I don't know it, but um, in situations where you have a very polarized environment like you have in Georgia today or in the United States or Poland, uh, Turkey, some of these countries that are so heavily polarized, um, you, you know, you have to pay close attention to these sorts of issues because immediately if you get, if you're lumped in with one side, then you know the other side perceives you as either the adversary or the enemy, um, and, and so those who want to serve as neutral arbiters, friends of Georgia, who are neither pro UNM, pro European Georgia, pro Georgian Dream, but just simply want Georgia as Georgia to succeed, have to be very careful not to fall into the trap of appearing to belong to one of the sides in what is usually seen as a bipolar sort of existential type of situation. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think that's very important for those of us who comment on Georgia, who work on Georgia, to maintain that strict impartiality. It doesn't mean that when I go to Georgia, I'm not going to meet with UNM or, or European Georgia or Georgian Dream. Of course I am. Uh, I want to hear from everybody when I'm there, and Republicans and everybody else. But, uh, but you've you got to be very careful. We have to see if the MDI or IRI polls look very different from another. I don't think they have one so far. No, I don't think so. Um, further? Yes, sir. Yeah, hello. My name is uh, Miro Kupade from FBRI. I have a real question from the standpoint of Georgian citizen sitting in Georgia and hearing like those statements coming from Washington, D.C. From the, uh, from the uh, pro government media, it says that because of that, uh, and a lot of this, and uh, UNM is doing this, and uh, from the uh, and from the opposition side, because of the prosecution of uh, opposition leaders, and we see lots of um, um, democratic backsliding. So, what should we, as Georgian citizens, believe? So, are these statements like serious? We should pay attention. The statement comes from Senate, from the House, 
And if they are serious, do you think this will be translated into policy? That's, that's the my question, because Georgia is really polarized. People really don't know what is going on, and they've been manipulated by the both sides. So please. And my question is to Michael and to Swanti Cornell and to all of them. You have the microphone, so why don't you start? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think the, the comments made by the members of Congress should be taken very seriously. Um, the fact that various different parties are here in Washington lobbying, oh, well, that's you know an unfortunate fact of reality in Washington. Um, but that doesn't mean that when members of Congress on both sides of the aisle come out with a statement, but that statement shouldn't be taken seriously. It should be taken very seriously because this is an indication that in our own polarized environment in the U.S., when you get Republicans and Democrats signing on to something like that, it shows you that there's some common ground there. And I know that you know, with Georgia, maybe to a lesser extent than some other countries in the region, sometimes some countries fall into the trap of, well, one party is more closely affiliated with one of the two U.S. political parties and the other with another one. That's a very dangerous trap to fall into. But I think for now, the, the bipartisan consensus on Georgia is there. And that's an important statement. And what else? Do you want to address No, sure. I mean, I, I think to, 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 to add to that, I think it's, uh, we're not only dealing with the United States or not only with the Congress. I think the, uh, the, uh, the sentiments that you find uh, formulated in the letters from members of Congress uh, is much broader. It's something that you see from European governments. It's something you see from a lot of people who have invested time and energy in support of Georgia for a very long period of time. I think it should absolutely be taken seriously. Now, we know if your question is, will it be translated into policy and what that policy would be, uh, your guess is as good as mine, because in this political environment we're living in, it's very hard to know. Uh, but I, I, I would be uh, surprised if, if, this, uh, if the same feelings were not quite strong within the administration itself, definitely among the career people in the administration who I think have a pretty strong ability to influence policy on an issue that is not at the very high top of the, let's call it the Twitter agenda. Further, anyone else who would like to add to the conversation? Yes, ma'am. Hello, uh, I'm Hatina, and I'm also talking as a Georgian citizen. Uh, I work here, but uh, I was in, involved in elections for like many years, and uh, there were two points I wanted to mention. For 2004 elections, one thing uh, you did mention the best of miles is that after elections, the results of proportional elections were abolished, but not the results of majoritarian elections were abolished. And so it's not possible that in the same precinct there is like one election fair and the second election not fair because the same people were voting. And so that's important, uh, uh, important fact because it was that time when that democratic government accepted help from majoritarian MPs back in 2004. And in 2012, also, for 24 hours, CEC did not release the results of the election. And then they were saying that the systems were hacked, and there were some, like, I don't know, some lots of traffic. And there were rumors that only after the call from State Department, CEC released the results of 2012 elections. And that's also important for 2012, and I truly believe that some of the precincts people who are standing out in 2012 were really fraudulent, but eventually, whatever results were there, people were accepted, and during that, majoritarian elections, there were around 30 seats when opposition won. So, but my question is about, that you mentioned that 2012 elections, more or less, were like free and uh, fair based on like um, assessments but many people remember what was uh, be before 2012 elections for nine months and 11 months and pre-election situation and uh, now we have 2020 elections but we have history of 2016 elections 2018 elections and uh, will this 2020 election will be the same standard as all other elections, including 2012, and in terms of assessment of the elections, will it be like, in terms of using administrative resources, or what kind of standards will be applied to 2012 election, that what gives you a doubt that these elections will not be 
um, fair uh, or do have any kind of information that Central Election Commission is not conducting its business uh, because last few years, I believe, proved different. You are the election expert, so we'll get back to you. <laughs> uh, well, the short answer is you, I don't know what the assessment will be like. I mean, we don't know what the election result will be like, uh, much less the assessment. So we'll have to see. Uh, it, it, we have fallen into a bit of a trap with OSCE, ODIR uh, election reports, in that they sort of fall into a pattern. The vote was featured some irregularities. There was a, a, abuse of administrative resources but the election was declared more or less okay. Uh, sort of that's what they come out with, some version of that for everybody. And so when you come out with some version of that for everybody, uh, it, it loses its, its meaning. So you really have to look carefully at what they write and, and, and read the whole report. And don't spin it. And don't spin it, yeah. When you read the whole report, they usually actually lay out if it's, if it's free or for it. Now they don't give a pass or fail grade, they can't do that. But, um, but with this election, I think it's very careful to look beyond the spin, as, as, as you're saying, and, and really look at what are the concrete facts laid out in the election. Because obviously there's a gray zone from perfectly you know, conducted, sparkling, uh, to not so sparkling. But as we know, even perfect calls aren't perfect in this country. And so uh, you, know, you need to look, sorry, <laughs> but you, you need to look very carefully at the wording because uh, there will be spin. Anthony? Uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, I would just add, um, I think, you know, um, there was a, a mention of getting, uh, flooding the country with observers. I believe the, the Georgian government fully uh, welcomed such a move and, and did in, in previous elections. Uh, one thing I've noticed, though, and um, in terms of uh, my own observations, uh, and those, I think, reported by uh, credible uh, organizations is that a lot of the suspicious activity, and you, you do see this in the reports every year, uh, every election, uh, but much of it tends to happen disproportionately in the minority regions. And so, uh, where you rarely see as many observers as you might in, in Tbilisi, and with a good reason, most of the precincts are in larger cities, but a lot of those activities, such as are being alluded to, do take place up there. And there's no coincidence that um, uh, ruling parties tend to do quite well in, in the minority regions. So uh, I would, uh, I, I believe we need to pay more attention, as I mentioned in my comments before. Um, another topic that's that's not really been discussed, that's not, uh, that's not kind of CIA for, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of timely, necessarily timely or accurate results reporting, but uh, Georgia has, has dallied with the notion of introducing some type of election technology into uh, ballot counting and reporting. In fact, they went so far as to, to develop software for such a system only to have the notion um, uh, rejected in Parliament. Um, it's Again, it's not a perfect solution because I think we've seen in, uh, in, 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 uh, in recent history uh, that paper-based is still truly the one reliable means of, uh, of counting uh, results. Uh, by the same time, you could have a, a, a hybrid option where you have a, a ballot scanner that would count the results, and then you have a paper backup, and you can report these results in an expedient manner to the district commission and onward to the CEC as well. Um, it's not necessarily an expensive venture, but it's something that the, the, the authorities need to embrace. I'm not proposing it, only that Georgians themselves have considered it. Uh, in fact, at the time, uh, it was considered under the uh, previous chair, uh, I know that Madame Giovanni, the current chair, had considered it too, but the previous chair, Mr. Harjishvili, went to great lengths to investigate uh, the possible introduction of such a technology uh, even before the 2012 elections. Uh, but again, it has not been approved, uh, something that is worth considering. Yes, ma'am. Probably will be the last question we'll have time for. The camera is only for the, the microphone is only for the camera, so you'll still need to speak up for the people in the back. Okay, I, I will speak up. This is just a very brief response um, to um, my carpenter's comment uh, on the ODIR, um, which is just to say that uh, if you look at uh, the ODIR's election assessments, you, you will see uh, that there is a range. Uh, and so uh, I wouldn't want anyone to come away thinking that 
uh, they can't have confidence in um, ODIR election assessments. They do remain the gold standard uh, for the U.S. for election monitoring, and there is quite a range uh, if you look at their recent, for example, um, parliamentary election assessments. You'll see quite a range. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time, but I, I, there is one question that I'd like to, to, to pose to you, whoever would like to, to answer. I, um, um, I was struck by something that came up, Ambassador and, uh, and Mike and both of you are uh, in, your, uh, in your comments, which is that the importance of the high-level dialogue between, in this case, uh, in Mr. Baker's case, directly with President Shevardnadze on a first-name basis, and obviously with, uh, with President Saakashvili, there were similar levels of, uh, of, of communication. What do we have today? Uh, especially given the case, I mean, the elephant in the room, if you will, is the, the role of Mr. Ivanishvili, who was not the president or the prime minister, but the chairman of the ruling party. And we all know that he calls a lot of more shots in Georgia than just being the chairman of the party uh, implies. Is there that level of communication? Who could even talk to him the way uh, American representatives talk to to Shabarnaz or to Saakashvili, and is that something you think is being done? I don't have any present knowledge of that, so I won't comment on that. Well, um, I think that when U.S. officials travel to Tbilisi at the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State or the Assistant Secretary of State level, I think they do generally tend to meet with Mr. Ivanishvili. Um, and, you know, if, say, uh, Mike Pompeo were to go out to Tbilisi, uh, I would think that he would have meetings uh, with a wide range of folks, and he would be very firm uh, on what he expects to see in the elections from all parties, including the opposition, uh, but also <coughs> including Mr. Ivanishvili. So I, I don't think it's a, as much of a challenge as perhaps it appears at first blush to have the tough conversations that we're having. There's not one single point of reference to, to reach out to, uh, but, uh, but I think it's certainly necessary to talk to all parties, and including uh, to Ivanashvili, who runs the largest party in Georgia. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're, we're running out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our speakers for coming here and sharing their views with us. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'm, uh, in, in coming weeks and months, we'll all have um, a lot of opportunities to, to keep uh, watching developments not only in Georgia but across the region. We hope to invite you back here uh, soon enough. And again, thank you for coming.